Coming up on Lawmakers... The House passes the FY 2004 supplemental budget. New Senate maps are approved by committee. And Grady Health System CEO speaks out about proposed cuts to Georgia's health care programs. Those stories and more are coming up next. Live from Atlanta, this is Lawmakers for Wednesday, February 18th. Here are your hosts, Nwandi Lawson and Gerald Bryant. Good evening, everyone. Also on tonight's broadcast, the Senate approves an ethics bill that bans contract lobbyists from using public agency funds for their efforts. And in a bipartisan effort for child endangerment legislation, Governor Sonny Perdue and Lieutenant Governor Mark Taylor joined forces to pre at Prevent Child Abuse Day at the Capitol. But our top story tonight, the House passes the supplemental budget. And the House today agrees to a mid-year budget. Seven Republican attempts to amend the plan fail. Most of the debate centers around $90 million in nursing home revenue identified last week. House Bill 1180 calls for $89 million to be set aside for next year's budget, ostensibly to reduce cuts to education. The House Minority Leader questions whether this is a good idea in the face of an uncertain financial future. If we had some extra money, let's say we did have $89 million extra dollars, wouldn't it be wise and prudent and good business sense to be cautious before we go about spending any money that we think is extra in light of the current financial situation? Well, I respect your opinion, but let me talk about something else. Do you think it's wise and prudent to pay, have pay raises for state employees and school teachers? When we got economic downturns, businesses wouldn't run that business that way, but we're going to give pay raises, which are well deserved. But I just wonder whether or not this is the right time to do that, Mr. Richardson. Uh, and and uh, at this point in time, unfortunately, I, I don't. I, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that question by saying that uh, at my uh, office, we were uh, having a little bit of a downturn too. But to try to keep our employees and try to c continue to stimulate the economy, we did give pay raises uh, because they. All practice it. must be pretty lucrative. Uh, it, it actually is a little bit down, sir, especially when I've been down here for the last, it seems like six out of the last 12 months. The amended budget increases by $90 million, Governor Sonny Perdue's proposal. It passes the House 102 to 68 and is immediately transmitted to the Senate. We'll bring you expanded coverage of today's budget debate later in our broadcast. Meanwhile, Grady Health System CEO Dr. Andy Aguanobi held a media luncheon today to uh, discuss the health care crisis in Georgia and some of the changes Grady is making to adapt. David Zelsky joins us live from the Capitol Plaza with more on Grady's situation. David. Well, thanks, Gerald. You know, over the past couple of years, the Grady Health System has fallen over $60 million in debt. And Dr. Aguanobi says that the proposed cuts in the state budget to health care will only add to the problem. Doctors at the Grady Health System are concerned. This is a huge threat to health care in Georgia. Dr. Aguanobi, better known as Dr. Andy, has already made some major money-saving changes, including some 300 layoffs coming this April. But he says for the Grady Health System to overcome this deficit, they need the state's help. As the largest provider of Medicaid care in the state of Georgia, and as an institution that has as its largest line item on its budget, Medicaid, which is 43% of our net revenues, uh, the proposed Medicaid cuts are, are going to be devastating for Grady Health System. Another pressing issue here for the Grady Health System is setting up a statewide trauma network. This level one trauma center here at Grady is the only one within a hundred mile radius. It wouldn't even cost that much to get started. If we look at our regulations, if we look at how we regionalize or fail to regionalize care, we can move very solidly in the right direction. The fact is there are a lot of insured patients who are trauma victims who aren't getting to trauma centers. That insurance revenue could help support a functioning trauma network and not cost taxpayers a dime. The Fulton and DeKalb delegation, um, they're all very, most of them that I've talked to are very supportive of the statewide trauma network and they're very concerned about the Medicaid cuts. Now, Georgia's trauma death rate is well above the national average, but doctors at Grady say that if this statewide trauma network is enacted, then they could lower to that national average and in turn save about 700 lives every year. Reporting live, I'm David Zelsky for Lawmakers. Thank you very much, David. Meanwhile, the Senate Reapportionment Committee takes only 30 minutes to approve a map of new Senate districts. The legislature has less than two weeks to comply with a federal court deadline. We're here because the uh, courts have returned uh, both the state Senate and the state House map to us, and they did so because of uh, the issue regarding deviation uh, and uh, primarily the issue of one person, one vote. 
uh, and they directed us to correct that. And consequently, that's where, where we began in this process, uh, starting with uh, attempting to have uh, all 56 state Senate uh, districts uh, be of equal size. Senfair 8 is the proposal before us. It um, comprises uh, 56 state Senate districts, uh, each of which have a deviation of less than 1%. The current map has 82 county split. That is, the unconstitutional map has 82 county split. Uh, Senfair 8 has 33 counties that are split. Uh, the current map has 212 precincts uh, that are split, and uh, that is the unconstitutional map, and the proposed map has uh, in the range of 30 to 35. The Senate map passed out of committee today is slightly changed from one unveiled yesterday. This one has fewer Democratic incumbents in the same district. Chairman Tom Price commented that the new districting plan has 14 minority majority districts. Also, the new Senate map is expected to be debated in the full Senate on Friday. The House Reapportionment Committee meets tomorrow and is expected to pass their plan to redraw House district maps. Well, child abuse, preven excuse me, child abuse prevention has been an issue high on Governor Sonny Perdue's platform since he took office last year. Today, the governor was joined by Lieutenant Governor Mark Taylor for Prevent Child Abuse Day. Jesse Freeman is live with more about today's event. Jesse. Thanks, Enwandi. Today, child advocacy groups recognize Lieutenant Governor Taylor as well as the governor and Mary Perdue for their work in child protection. Taylor has supported child endangerment legislation for the past four years, and the governor has made it a priority of his term. Both Taylor and Purdue took the opportunity to advocate for the governor's child endangerment legislation, Senate Bill 467. There were more than 85,000 abuse and neglect reports in 2002. That's not the worst news. 51 fatalities. Ladies and gentlemen, those are not numbers that we can ever accept. The unanimous vote in the Senate the engrossment vote in the House yesterday, all of this indicates that we're moving toward final passage and it would not have been possible without all of your work, without all of your commitment, and I do sincerely appreciate it. As governor, you're trained not to uh, say whether you're going to sign or veto a bill uh, when it uh, is in moving through the General Assembly. But ladies and gentlemen, I can't wait till this bill gets to my desk to sign. Now, after the Senate passed it unanimously, the House yesterday engrossed Senate Bill 467. That means the bill will not be amended but voted on in its current form. Currently, Georgia is the only state that does not make child endangerment a felony. Reporting live, I'm Jesse Freeman for Lawmakers. Jesse, any idea about when this will be taken up in the House? It's still up in the air in Wandy. Uh, the House rules is yet to put it on the calendar. All right. Thanks so much, Jesse. Well, another child welfare news, a bill that could change the way daycare centers and child placement agencies obtain background checks on employees, receives a due pass from the House Children and Youth Committee. Lawmakers Chrissy Thrasher joins us live with more on House Bill 1347. Chrissy. In Wandy, this bill would allow these agencies to obtain background checks from local law enforcement agencies rather than through the Department of Family Services. Representative Judith Manning is sponsoring this legislation which will save eight to ten months in some instances, but at least six weeks because of the, par the department's back backlog. And this has been a bill that's been needed for I don't know how long, and we just finally have been able to get the, the language correct so that everybody's passed out on it. And obviously the Children and Youth Committee did as well, and so we'll move forward to rules. In addition to saving time, House Bill 1347 would also provide financial benefits for those foster parent agencies wanting to obtain a background check. Representative Manning explains. It only costs $15 at the local police station, and if you go through the department, sometimes it takes a lot longer and a lot more steps, and it, it costs more money. And House Bill 1347 now goes to the Rules Committee. Reporting live, I'm Chrissy Thrasher for Lawmakers. Chrissy, what kind of support is this bill receiving? Representative Manning said this bill is receiving a lot of report from several agencies throughout the state, as well as the Office of School Readiness. Thanks so much, Chrissy. Well, criminal background checks are also part of a Senate bill regulating firearms dealers. Senate Bill 528 introduced today would transfer the regulation of firearm dealers from the Department of Public Safety to the State Revenue Commissioner. Firearms dealers applying for a license would have to submit to a criminal background check as part of the licensing process. 
And the Senate today passes an ethics bill that restricts what contract lobbyists for state agencies can do. Here's Senator Don Cheeks as he explains Senate Bill 446 and answers some questions. Senators, this is a very simple bill. It does one thing and one thing only. A contract lobbyist can't take the money that we're appropriating and divide it up and pass it back to spend it to try to lobby us to get more money for themselves. All other lobbyists are exempt. The only people that this will touch a contract lobbyist. Now, if you want me to explain what a contract lobbyist is, that's, I could call names, but you know better than I do. That's when you're hired for a contract and you're paid a monthly, weekly, hourly salary, and your job is to come back to this capital and ask us to take tax dollars and give back to that agency so they can pay you so you can disperse it. That's a contract lobbyist. Will the Senator further yield? I yield. So, Senator, as I understand it then, and please correct me if I'm wrong, your bill then is directed at state agencies. Would it cover anybody besides a state agency that receives state dollars uh, that, you know, is hiring a contract lobbyist? Let me see if I understand your question. State agencies are exempt. I could call names. For example, Board of Regents has a, a lobbyist. But he's a paid state employee that happens to give us information that we all need. He is exempt. He is not a contract lobbyist. Let's clarify this, though. If, for example, any state agency or employee may go out and hire, you're talking about a contract lobbyist but not a full-time employee. Now, if the senator will yield. I yield. What is to prevent a state agency, DOT, DNR, whoever, from hiring somebody and putting them on part-time public relations, government affairs, they would be an employee of the agency drawing a quasi-salary and they'd accomplish the same thing, wouldn't they? Senator, uh, there's always a way to skirt around the law if you want to attempt to do it, and I don't think that we have ever passed legislation that completely keeps people honest. And this piece of legislation will not keep all apartments honest, if that's your question. So your answer, I guess, would be yes, they could do it. Senate Bill 446 passes 48 to 0 and goes to the House. Well, DUI victims may be honored with signs paid for by increasing DUI fines. Senator Randy Hall explains House Bill 20. Very simply, if enacted, this bill would raise the statutory DUI fine by one dollar. That money would be paid over to the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. And it would be used to fund the manufacture and the erection of this sign, which has been designed by the Georgia Department of Transportation, for the purpose of providing a roadside memorial to victims of DUI drivers. The signs will be replaced, will be placed, I'm sorry, at the written request of the family only, will be for a period of five years, and the DOT has the discretion to place the sign at or near the site of the accident and the death in keeping in mind the safety of drivers and of the roadways. House Bill 20 passed with no opposing votes. It now goes to Governor Perdue. And the Senate passes two House retirement bills today. The bills will allow state employees and teachers to get some of their retirement money in a lump sum. It puts an option in for state employees that are retiring. And that option is that when they retire, they can choose a lump sum distribution of 36 months of their retirement benefits. Now this does not cost the state any money. It's a, it is a benefit that many other states provide and the idea behind this is if, if an employee is retiring and say they want to buy a lake home and it gives them an opportunity to get 36 months of retirement, say they were going to get $2,000 a month, they could get $72,000 as a lump sum, then their monthly retirement benefit is actuarially reduced uh, to, a, to an amount that would be less than what they would take if they just took it on a monthly basis, and therefore it does not cost the state anything. What happens if he retires and you give him $25,000 lump sum? Then he passes away the next year. Well, on on uh, if if he if he say he received twenty five and I had a concern there, uh, Senator, and I asked 
the members of both TRS and ERS, the, the directors of those various agencies, and they said that under the state employees retirement and under the teachers retirement system that if they were to retire, sign their papers, walk out, get run over in the street, walking out into the street, you say, well, then they don't, they don't get any additional benefits. But that's not the case because all of the employees' contributions plus interest would be given to their estate. And they assured me that 36 months of, of benefits, a lump sum of 36 months of benefits, would never exceed the employee's contribution plus benefits. So they would take this lump sum distribution if they got killed the next day and didn't have a successor beneficiary, then their estate would get the balance of whatever that fund balance would be. House Bills 914 and 917 pass without opposition. Both bills go to the governor. For those of you with access to the Internet, you can watch lawmakers online. Visit our website at gpb.org for more information. Click on Watch Online, then follow the instructions for watching live or looking at past lawmakers' programs in our archives. That website address again is gpb.org. Just another way we keep you apprised of what's going on at the General Assembly. And we'd like to recommend another website that's a valuable resource for information about the Georgia General Assembly. Go to www.legis.state.ga.us. That website is a great research tool we here at lawmakers use on a regular basis. As we reported earlier, a spending plan for the remainder of this fiscal year clears the House today with voting mostly along party lines. Republican legislators make seven attempts to alter the bill, including an amendment requiring the state to use $43 million for the construction of a West Georgia reservoir. Former House Speaker Tom Mur Murphy had marshaled the allocation of the money several years ago. Since he's no longer serving in the General Assembly, Representative Glenn Richardson said the House had cannibalized the program and established a dangerous precedent. If you've got a project in your district to build a lake or build a college campus or to do something in your district and it gets voted on and bonds get sold on there and then you're not here next year, do you think your person sitting to your left and right is going to come in and say, hey, oh, representative fill in the blank, you not here anymore. Hey, we need to spend that money. It's in the bank. Let's spend it. Let's take it away from that project. And that's what we're doing. And if you'll do it to this man, if they'll do it to Tom Murphy, what do you think they're going to do to you? The House budget includes $160 million in cuts to K-12 and college education. Representative Brooks Coleman wanted to know how this would impact a new state curriculum. They plan this summer to roll out uh, the first phase of this new curriculum. And I'm very concerned because we had set aside this money for the rollout. And I heard the gentleman as he presented the budget, is it not true, state that we'd probably have to put this back. Then my question is, why did we pull this in the first place? Well, the subcommittee members were not real sure at the time this was put together over the course of our deliberations and hearings uh, exactly when this curriculum was going to be ready. And as I did mention to you, this is an item we're probably going to have to look at again when we get to conference. Well, I hope we and really it's an important do. item. I it know very is, sir. It's very important. And they are planning to roll it out so with all the public. Well, thank good you, sir. luck to them. Hey, thank you, sir. The House Appropriations Chair reminds his colleagues that the budget process is long and will ultimately conclude in conference committee. He agrees with Representative Fran Millar that in the meantime, efforts should be made to restore some programs. I've got a hard time seeing us reduce tuition for the severely emotionally disturbed, for multi-handicapped, and for preschool handicapped. And the only thing I'd ask if you would, when you get to the conference committee, if we're not helping people who can't help themselves, and we maybe need to pack up and go home. Well, your point's well taken, Mr. Millar. And I uh, would remind you, those that uh, these are cuts that were uh, put in the budget by Governor Purdue's office. And we're just uh, going along with his cuts. Is, isn't it true that I understand that? I hope and, so. it, and isn't it true what I'm saying? I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. I think I hope we can revisit these. I think we both share the same feelings about these projects. Thank and you, I Mr. think Bob. every member in the House does. Thank you, sir. To recap, the House approved spending through June 30th of the year with no amendments. The bill is now in the Senate, where more revisions are almost certain. Well, today is day 20 of the Georgia General Assembly, the halfway point. We thought this would be a good time to give you an update on some of this session's major legislation.
The House passed the supplemental budget today. It goes to Senate Appropriations. The FY 2005 budget resides in the House Appropriations Committee. Two proposed constitutional amendments have passed the Senate. The faith-based initiative would allow religious or sectarian groups to receive public money for providing social services. The Defense of Marriage Act puts a ban on gay marriage in the state constitution. Both those resolutions are in House rules. Two Hope Scholarship bills are in the Senate Higher Education Committee. SB 471 incorporates the Hope Commission recommendations to cut books and student fees from Hope Scholarships. Governor Sonny Perdue endorses that plan. SB 520, backed by Lieutenant Governor Mark Taylor, would retain books and fees. Two education funding proposals remain in the House Ways and Means Committee. SR 580, which has passed the Senate, would allow special local option sales taxes to stave off property tax increases. HR 1265 would replace property taxes with a sales tax to fund schools. Governor Purdue's education package, all three bills, have passed the Senate and are in the House Education Committee. Senate Bill 428 includes a provision to take driver's licenses away from unruly students. SB 429 is designed to give the Office of School Achievement more flexibility. And SB 456 is the reorganization of the Office of School Readiness, which would become right from the start. In other high-profile legislation, the Child Endangerment Bill, backed by Governor Purdue and Lieutenant Governor Taylor, is engrossed in the House Judiciary Committee after passing the Senate. The House and Senate couldn't agree on a version of HB 237, the State Water Management Plan. It's in a conference committee. HB 709, the bill that would allow Atlantans to vote on a 1% sales tax to bail out the city's aging sewer system, passed the House, was changed in the Senate, and is back in the House. The bill banning smoking in most public places is in the Senate Health and Human Services Committee. Court-ordered redrawing of State House and Senate districts is on a fast track. The Senate Reapportionment Committee passed a new map today. The full Senate may vote on Friday. New House maps are expected to be passed out of the House Reapportionment Committee tomorrow. And that's your halftime legislative scorecard. Billing regulations and penalties were considered by the House Public Utilities Committee today. House Bill 1430 gives consumers 20 days to pay bills along with an eight-day grace period. The bill also calls for penalties of $10 or 1.5 percent, whichever is greater. The period of bill payment was changed from 34 days to 28 in an effort to keep the bills from running into the next cycle. We want to stay out of the next billing cycle. So this was agreeable to the author and so the 20 days was uh, already in the bill, I think. It's, what, it's uh, in the rule. In the rule. And so she was agreeable to go in, instead of saying the 28 days, which could then one day before maybe the next reading cycle. So this was 20 plus 8 grace period, which is the same thing. Yes, sir. House Bill 1430 was given a due pass by committee substitute and moves to the House Rules Committee. Meanwhile, a House Higher Education Subcommittee passed a resolution today that could change the way certain types of educational facilities are funded. House Resolution 1170 would amend the Georgia Constitution by removing capital outlay projects from programs funded by lottery proceeds. Representative Chuck Martin says this legislation will be of benefit to the Hope Scholarship. This is a great outcome of it. Um, the spreadsheet that, that I look at here has, you know, 8.2 percent of all hope revenues over the past years uh, have been spent on these capital outlay projects, and, and, it, and on a year-to-year -year basis, they were, according to the Constitution, it, it isn't it true by doing this document B that we'll preserve the money for the outstanding students as the commission wanted to do. And, and House Resolution 1170 now goes to the House Higher Education Committee. Governor Sonny Perdue yesterday recognized 18 community service organizations considered valuable to maintaining criminal justice in the state. Financial awards accompanied the kudos for groups, including Cobb County's Safe Path Child Advocacy Center. All right.
Alrighty. Very good. That was fun. Tell me about your program. The Action Peace Center. Okay. Where we do collaboration and coordination and intervention of sexual abuse and severe physical abuse, working very collaboratively with law enforcement, DFAGS, Department of Family and Children's Services. Same thing I told you last week. Safe Path was chosen because of their innovativeness and their dedication to serving not only children, but family members or caregiver members who are also impacted by the violent crime that's affected those children. Safe Path is one of 27 children's advocacy centers in the state. The Governor's Criminal Justice Coordinating Council awards $30 million in grants to over 200 organizations each year. Former Speaker of the House Tom Murphy remains in serious condition at Piedmont Hospital. The Speaker is recovering from two recent strokes. In the Senate today, Senator Faye Smith told of getting some help from Mr. Murphy once when she was seeking funding for the War Veterans Home in Milledgeville. And as I came around the corner, I met the Speaker. Sorry. Well, he, he was with his driver, and he was leaving for the day. And I came up to him and swung my arm in his arm, and I said, uh, Mr. Speaker, may I talk to you a second? He said, uh, well, of course, Senator, tell me what you need. And I said, well, Senate Appropriations just did something that the House didn't do, and they placed money back in the War Veterans Home. What I need you to do for me is when it goes to conference committee, would you please help keep that money in the supplemental budget for the War Veterans Home in Mellotron? He looked at me and he said, whatever I can do, Senator, I will do. And I shook hands, I kissed him on the cheek, and I told him I knew his word was as good as anything that I could expect. I would ask that we stand with permission of the President and that we have a moment of silence for the Speaker uh, of the House, the former Speaker, and lift our prayers and our thoughts and our meditation on behalf of his good return to a healthy life. And we'll keep you updated on the speaker's condition. Coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, the Senate Higher Education Committee is expected to discuss the HOPE scholarship bill that would eliminate payment for books and fees from HOPE grants. And a House vote is expected on Representative Bob Holmes' measure that would delay implementation of the state test to retain third graders. We'll have those stories and all the latest from Under the Gold Dome tomorrow at 7 on Lawmakers. Just another reminder for those of you with access to the Internet, you can watch Lawmakers online. Just visit our website at www.gpb.org. Lawmakers is streamed live and archived on our site every night that we're on the air. Now stay tuned for Travels in Europe. That program is next here on Georgia Public Broadcasting. And we've reached the halfway point. That's our broadcast for this, the 20th day of the Georgia General Assembly. Thanks for joining us. I'm in Wandy Lawson. And I'm Gerald Bryan. For everyone here at Lawmakers, have a great evening. Good night. Bye.